This is the original 1995 boxed game uh, from Games Workshop and I'd make an argument that this is, I don't know exactly how you rank these things, but one of the best or at least one of the most interesting, but genuinely I think one of the best RPGs going in the 1990s. And that might sound weird because this is a board game box, right? Uh, this is um, for two to four players, age 12 for adults, uh, and it's uh, in a GW board game box and uh, you know you you just it's it's a dungeon crawling board game but there is a lot more going on in this so let's have a look um, I'll look at the box a bit uh, and then uh, not that you desperately need to know that you can google it but just to give a sign of the sorts of things in there a relevant thing you get obviously get lots of stuff in here you get lots of uh, dungeon doorways and here's a, an orc archer figure um, and here's a um, dwarf warrior. The, you get four warriors in the box, uh, and you get all the stuff to do with them. You get uh, you know event cards, that's random encounter cards, basically dungeon cards, the rooms room. You get the tiles themselves, which are are very nice. And um, I can show you one there. You know, good thick cardstock. It's it's a well produced game. Um, you also get uh, two types of die which is the very quickest observation. As you see, you get a tiny die, you get a normal die, and a tiny die, normal die, tiny die. Uh, the tiny die are used to record uh, wounds on monsters and um, wizard power and a couple of other things potentially. But there's, you know, there's things like that that you can uh, um, use the small die for. And it's kind of, it's theoretically sort of ergonomic because uh, it, um, it, it fits onto smaller spaces and doesn't take up too much room but I can imagine them being a pain if you're at all careless with them but the more uh, the, the the relevant thing to observe about the contents other than oh well it includes all the stuff you'd expect in a dungeon calling board game is include well includes four booklets technically four booklets one is a four page getting started which was pretty common for that era 95 uh, is notable thinking of as, isn't it the same year possibly as Second Ed 40K? I need to check. Um, it's the same year or the year before uh, Warhammer 5th uh, edition. So it's at a point where GW is now seriously into boxed games. Um, you know, they've earlier in the 90s, they published uh, Warhammer 4th edition in a boxed game, in a properly boxed game. They've published Man of War. Um, they, have, they have had Talisman out. And a few other things like this. Warhammer Quest, it should be said, is a development of Hero Quest, which was a, the licensed product which Milton Bradley uh, put out for GW. Um, and particularly, I think of possibly of advanced Hero Quest. Basically, there is a thing. Uh, there are a few things going on which you can see as developments of that, and which are all part of pushing this towards being a proper role-playing game, not just a dungeon crawler. Um, to put it differently, a d dungeon crawling board games are things like. Descent or Imperial Assault, in fact, Star Wars Imperial Assault, or um, a Gloomhaven is is actually a good comparison. I found that Gloomhaven is this GMless halfway house with randomly generated events. It's got dungeons. You go to the dungeons, you do stuff. Those might have story impacts, and uh, you can upgrade characters and stuff. And um, that is one layer of how quest can be. I'll talk about that in a second. And there's random events and stuff. Whereas uh, uh, obviously, we think of, say, in something more like Descent uh, or Mice and Mystics. There might be some persistence, and there is in, in both those, um, but uh, it's it's at a lesser degree. Uh, something like Hero Quest, again, at a lesser degree. And then at the other end, you've got role-playing games, things like Dungeons and Dragons or uh, Traveller or stuff, where um, the game is the persistence at some level, at least as originally designed um, with uh, characters you continue through with a world created by the GM. There may be pre-generated modules in there, but the idea is that they are uh, kind of, they're meant to feel like role-playing games. They're things where you're playing a specific role in the game. Um, and there's this sort of, it's hard to completely describe the difference, um, but uh, there is a flexibility and openness, let's say that, in the, in the intended classic role-playing games. But the, so the first book, um, getting started. The second book that you'll read is the rule book. The third book you'll read is the adventure book. And the fourth book you read, comfortably the longest as well, 190 pages, is the role play book. The rule book is 32 pages. The adventure book is shorter, it'll be 24, I guess, something like that. 
uh, maybe less than that, <laughs> 16, um, and the getting started is four pages. One other observation about Warhammer Quest as a role-playing game. Games Workshop were not publishing uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay at this point. Um, the publisher was Hogshead Publishing, I think, in 95, and I remember getting, I was getting into GW stuff at the time, and um, the and White Dwarf and the journal, but more relevantly, I guess, White Dwarf, had no mention of these things. Uh, and um, I think there's really obvious reasons why. There's a couple of reasons why um, that come to my mind as to why, because I, I wasn't in, in Nottingham at the time or whatever. Were they in Nottingham um, by then? Or were they still in Leicester or whatever? Uh, but uh, what was it that they moved within Nottingham? But yes, the... Uh, you know, they, they had this, uh, the problem of how you make money off stuff. And you look at TSR at the same period, aiming a lot more books at players. You look at White Wolf with the big meta plot, uh, and both TSR and White Wolf selling these kind of incredibly fluffy books with loads of story, frankly not very useful for gameplay, uh, but really aimed at people buying to collect or f at players looking to have cheesy powers. That's the uh, obvious implication of how TSR published a lot of their books. Um, and... Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay had had adventures and had other stuff, but um, it, it, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, GW didn't want to bring it in-house, didn't want to push that. Whereas Quest was something else. Quest meant they could sell miniatures. That's the first thing. And I'll quickly, I mean, I've got two of the expansions here. I technically have a third. Uh, here's a couple of um, character packs, which one from War Dancer. I also have the Imperial Noble. Uh, and these guys are a figure and a little booklet which is the character booklet which does various things with them plus a couple of cards to represent their special items but you know the, the booklet gives you all the rules including the uh, advanced game rules so you sell miniatures and the expansions the two proper expansions they did have like five miniatures each or six miniatures each in them um they they're also treasure cards uh, and uh, things like that there are treasure packs i think three of them but they were selling miniatures basically because they're a miniatures company and on the front of these you have games workshop and citadel miniatures advertised so this was a game that rather than it being just a couple of books people bought uh, th these are a board game with expansions that you buy and they sell the miniatures with them and that's the kind of gimmick i think it also is leaning into the 12 and up uh, is one indication though i mean D, D would have thought of itself as that in the beginning uh, but also of the fact that I remember the plenty of kids younger than that uh, in GW stores at the time. I think what you're looking at instead is it, also is that this is not a response to the satanic panic per se in Britain. There wasn't so much of one, though there certainly was was one when you look at some of the uh, kind of some materials about it. But I think the idea of it being a family friendly, uh, colourful pictures, fighting monsters game um very much posing heroically the characters are heroes rather than this much more uh well we use the word grimdark but you know grotty and uh, nasty and corrupt world in the fantasy role-playing game so this is filling their slot for an rpg when they're not using their own rpg license i said it's more than a a rule book um and that's where the most relevantly, the third of these books comes in the roleplay book, which adds in, it's got three main sections. They are basically linking games, warriors development, and the games master. Those are the three sections. And there's also a complete adventure, and I'll uh, say why that's relevant as well, surely you're always playing an adventure, but a complete adventure for a GM to run. What we will do first, though, is we'll talk about the, the core play and the core concept. So, you got a rule book. It's not a long rule, rule book. There are no, it's it's not particularly heavy either weight wise. I think it might be two point eight on BGG, but you know, it's typical uh, GW rule books of the time. Not tiny text. Though it's not massive. Two columns. Um, the rules are not terribly complicated. Having played through it, you know, several times now, having played and and enjoyed it a lot, it's. Uh, got a couple of odd little um, inconsistencies or unclarities, usually cleared up quickly. <clears throat> it has one specific issue which they more or less fixed with a, a white dwarf, which was so therefore semi-official or official rule called Hidden Passages, where uh, you could get an event if you only had one T-junction and you got the event, and you're in that and you got the event cave-in, uh, you could be trapped 
uh, possibly on the right side of the dungeon to leave, but in a way that you couldn't progress the mission. Uh, and essentially, this because this is purely random, you know, uh, based on the random event system, no player choice had gone into it. It was bad luck about where it came up. And Hidden Passages was essentially a way to either continue the dungeon after you'd finished the objective room, which is the kind of the boss fight, or if you got trapped from Caven and you couldn't pr progress. Uh, and so there's a few odd things like that that are missing. Um, there's a few inclarities, but it's generally speaking a pretty transparent and easy rule, book, uh, rule set. And um, though I made errors, or we made errors, I uh, played it with my son, uh, sons, in fact, the first few times, it, it wasn't that, you know, it was pretty easy. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. The the combat is probably the, the, the exploration, um, and I'll go through a bit more detail on these, the exploration is okay, the combat is pretty fun. Uh, the randomization, which is mostly on the exploration side, is is very swingy. And there's a couple of things like that, basically, that you're like, okay, this is um, a... Uh, this is a solid rule set, a good rule set even, uh, for a dungeon crawler, you know, compared to Hero Quest, compared to uh, later on, I'm not having played some of these games, Mice and Mystics is a better dungeon crawler than Mice and Mystics, which came out 20 years af uh, afterwards. Um, it is probably about as fun and, and slightly less complicated than Imperial Assault, um, you know, take that for what it's worth. But yeah, the basic cycle is that you... Uh, using, uh, I'll get out a couple of these bits just to demonstrate. You know, you have your, you, you have uh, a deck of the dungeon cards you need. Um, the objective room, the boss fight is in the bottom six. It's a, it's a deck of um, 13 cards. And uh, you can either have it strictly randomized or you can use a scenario from the adventure book, which is the second book, which so it's an, which is an integral part of it because it ha if nothing else, it has um, the escaping... Uh, the escaping rules and it has the uh, objective room generator for monsters so you, this is your starting room basically you've got a starting room uh, how about well we'll do it this way we'll do it this way so we've got a starting room and your fellas come in one of these is the entrance your fellas come in um, and these are the core four you've got your barbarian you've got a dwarf uh, you've got an elf who's a bowman basically um, and very nimble. We've got a wizard who's the only magic user. Uh, you, at the start of each turn, uh, you, uh, there's four phases. The power phase, the wizard generates how much temporary power he has for his spells. He also has a set amount of uh, consumable power that he has every adventure, um, which he can is more fungible. And if it's a one, there's also a random event. You draw an event card. The event is usually bad, kind in the sense it's usually dangerous. Uh, but not necessarily bad. Uh, even the, the traps, I, the, there's a trap event where if you roll a six on it, uh, on a d6, it actually ends up being um, a treasure. Uh, you'll then, if you're fighting, let's say you rolled one minotaur, you go and fight your minotaur, chop, 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 chop. And when you defeat it, you draw a treasure card. Treasure cards are magic items, generally speaking. Not always, uh, but pretty much, I think, in, in the core game. Um, and you you move around on your fa on your phase you move and you fight if the minotaur is still up um, he will then fight back in the monster phase if you are adjacent to another exit when the room is cleared the barbarian in the base game because he's carrying the lantern and the lantern the person is the leader and the leader has to be the person who explores he can if i can fix this on this is going to be horrendous isn't it he can explore the next room Okay, we're just going to leave that. You can explore the next room. And then you, you uh, as it's a dungeon room, there will be monsters automatically in it, in fact. Um, but yeah, so you do that. You go around and you look for the objective room. When you get to the objective room and clear it, and there may be special rules, minor special rules, based on the um, based on the adventure book, uh, you, you win the scenario. In the base game, there's technically a semi-competitive element where whoever uh, has scored the most, I'll mention that in a second more, wins or at least is the best player so how do you how do you measure winning and this is the first interesting thing it's actually via gold gold is um what you use for very basically for any sort of victory or advancement in the game and you get gold per monster that you kill um you get uh, gold for treasure that is unused at the end of the game and uh, this is a weird one this is only in the role play book it should be in the core rule book 
much like the escaping rules should either be in the core or the roleplay book, uh, the wizard earns XP for healing other people. So, uh, the, the, uh, but, sorry, GP. Uh, GP becomes XP in the advanced game. You go around, uh, there are random events, random events happening on a one, on a one in six, uh, D6, and uh, that happens every turn, and you fight monsters, and in the core there are two types of orcs, two types of goblins, uh, minotaurs, skaven, and four types of mobs, spiders, I t tiny ones, snotlings, spiders, um, bats, and rats. So there's a good section, I'll say in terms of miniatures, I think I was looking at the modern Warhammer quests and I think this has the most miniatures compared to, to the modern, the, the three proper modern Warhammer quests, uh, one of which actually is terrible. But what, uh, Cursed City has a decent number of figures to be fair, uh, the 2022 Warhammer quest. So yeah, that is the basic cycle. There are also other kinds of rooms, corridors and so on. Uh, the objective rooms um, can have special rules attached to both the room itself and the missions can have special rules. And basically the way you play the game is you take your four characters and uh, there are some random generation things to do with generating how many wounds they start with. Uh, the wizard ge randomly generates their power tokens and their spells, things like that. Uh, they're all good at different things. The barbarian is um, sort of his high highest wounds on average to start with, highest uh, strength can go berserk and get extra attacks. The elf has a bow and is very nimble, can break away from enemies uh, for free, things like that. The wizard has magic and the dwarf is very tough um, and can do a lot of damage with his great axe. So uh, there's character distinction. Uh, each game is going to, because it's randomised, going to feel different. You've got 30 adventures in the adventure book which have special rules. Um, ranging from the one they recommend you start with, uh, which uh, is the first game we played, which is using the fighting pit, it's called Free the Prisoners. In that one, the, there's no special rules for the room and that ends simply with um, the, uh, any goblins generated on the final room are Skaven instead and you get a certain amount of gold randomly, basically, based on how many prisoners you rescue. And then there's more complicated rooms, you know, big final boss rooms. Now that is the base game and the 30 adventures, there's a lot of kind of little tweaks and twists there beyond the pure, pure random generation of just picking a random room and, uh, and so on. It, so there is a lot of base gameplay, but what's evidently, you know, evident is that it's meant to be a campaign game. So at this point you start to step up from it's a advanced dungeon crawler. It's something that has little hints of a game that's more like D&D in terms of its procedure, random encounters, strong class distinction, things like that. The monsters obviously all have different abilities too. And section one of the art, the roleplay book, Linking Games, um, is where that comes in. And basically here you have a few things uh, to do with how you record what's happened to warriors after they finished. How do they, what happens between adventures because you're gonna go back out on an adventure. And basically there are two things you uh, you do between adventures. You travel to a settlement, rolling hazards based on the number of, uh, is it weeks, I think that you're traveling to get to a settlement. And then you, uh, in the settlement, can go to various locations, try to buy stuff. And the, and the settlements are akin to the um, the gang phase in Necromunda, if you played that. It's, a, it's an upkeep phase where you can go and buy stuff. You can. Uh, go and try to get, uh, learn, you know, learn skills at the ale house or get information or whatever. Uh, and one big thing about this, just like with the dungeon events, so the random encounters in the dungeon, the hazards in the wilderness and some, and the settlement events for each day you're there. And some of the events within the uh, locations are crazy. The variance is incredibly high between good and bad. Uh, so the hazards table, uh, for instance, 62, it's a D66 system. The brigands, basically there's a, um, a 50-50 chance of losing a bunch of gold or uh, winning a bunch of gold. Um, there is forest goblins ambushing you. It's a, uh, a D6 uh, roll again, which basically 50-50 on whether or not you win or lose. Uh, famine, um, you are really kind and to, you're forced to be kind to people suffering from famine and on a one to five give money to the poor or, or even treasure but on a six, you get a cool sword, a sword of sharpness. Uh, so yeah, there, uh, there are big 
big variations in the settlement there is a i think it'll be a one in 36 chance or something like that um sorry less less than that surely what well, it'll be one in 36 times six um uh 216 is that or something like that um of you just dying because i th that 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 is the uh the chance i think of getting into a duel and then losing it fatally um so yeah i mean th there's a lot of variation but then there is in the dungeon too this is a criticism and it, i mean i mean it as a criticism certainly in the sense that some of these things uh and don't really reward player choice uh, there are a couple of you could say well look when you are uh ambushed um or when whatever else you can choose to i think in each of those cases you can technically choose to give up money i don't think you can in the ambush from the forest goblins but i think maybe with the brigands you can there are some choices but this is a very 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 thin level of persistence it's meant to be something that's completely it's ai it's completely programmed and you can just play this you don't have a friend to be a dm this is a perfect single player game in that sense if you're up for it and i think it does say so in the role playing book um but you know you can just play this uh, on your own or with with your your brother or your dad or something and there's no gm and you're playing basically your own warhammer role-playing game where you travel around and then you go back out with the same warrior and the point is that warrior and it, it'd be weird to do section one where i guess you can buy stuff and each of these characters each of the core characters has a favored location in fact mostly that only I mean, they can go to the um the wizard can go to the wizard guild the elf can go to the elf quarter the dwarf can go to the dwarf guild master and the Barbarian really likes the Ale House, uh, but it's not the only person who can go there, technically. Um, but yes, they, you know, there, there's a degree there where you can gain stuff, but really you want to use that sec that the, the majority of Section 1, therefore, with the first half of Section 2, Warrior Development, which gives you training time and the ability to both go up battle levels, which is, you know, what it says on the tin, it's levels. Uh, I can show you. So, for instance, here's, here's your basic elf card with stats. Very well presented and uh, and clean and works very well in practice to do with, you know, ha what it's it's like Warhammer Fantasy with some alterations. Your weapon skill is compared to the enemy weapon skill for close combat. Ballistic skill is just an X plus, an N plus, um, but which is obviously based on the Warhammer Fantasy system. Strength and toughness are added to either your damage roll or to your... Uh, resistance to damage things like that and um, there are a few other things but then the adv elf advanced profiles just gives you stats when you go up one level that's uh, all pretty easy um, you can also gain skills uh, in uh, based on uh, yeah more or less luck <laughs> I guess uh, but you can uh, also gain extra skills um, as you go along the uh, yeah that that's the kind of the, the basic uh, idea but the interesting thing here is I think from I think that shows that you're pointing to it's very much a game and this is going to be relevant when we talk about the GM section is that gold is used to train um, by that I mean you have to pay the amount for your next battle level uh, the XP needed is not is not asymmetrical as for my D&D friends my old school D&D friends it's just 2,000 each for the first level or whatever it is and, and for the second level and then I think it scales up so everyone is, is essentially a fighter in D&D uh, &D terms. Everyone is 2,000 XP and you buy it. And of course, there are other things to buy. So here it's not strictly gold for XP because that same gold could be used instead uh, for um, weaponry or for uh, class-based activities that you need to spend money on. Like I think uh, the Troll... Sh uh, I don't know if the Dwarf has this. In, I don't know if the Dwarven Court has this, but the Troll Slayer, for instance, d can donate money uh, to the Troll Slayer, uh, Troll Slayer Shrine for potential benefits. All of that, by the way, is very randomised. The Troll Slayer, for instance, on a, you then roll one, uh, one d6, and if you roll a one, you're kicked out and you can't do anything there. You've given money, you've just lost it. It's it's a sort of, there is a very warhammery in terms of uh, the board games of the time and the attitude of the time, and you get this with things that Dave Jones actually says in the roleplay book, but there's an anarchic, silly farcical slapsticky element where just i think you're meant to roll with this you're you know this is um meant to be that it's dumb and just annoying things happen and that's thing you see people talk about house ruling random events down to a, a maximum per room or per dungeon or whatever 
uh, in the same, you know, you can see the logic behind that when there's such variance. Um, but yeah, basically uh, you do that, you gain skills, um, you can spend some money on equipment and then you spend it on leveling to get to back, which means that the, though it's very surface level in terms of, there's no sense of you being like, oh, I, I've, I've searched for something and I found a treasure or this has happened. Instead, you just automatically earned gold from killing an enemy and then you earn treasure from defeating, well, clearing a room, in fact, specifically. That's, though that's all very mechanized and dull in terms of its own, you know, thematic power. Um, it, it is the rudiments of something close to a gold for XP system uh, where the core thing you're doing is earning gold from the dungeon and so as opposed to story points from having defeated the enemy you defeat it when you defeat the final boss or whatever it is you get a treasure card or whatever the rules for the adventure say the basic loop therefore is actually not very dissimilar though it has obviously some differences to um once you're in a persistent campaign uh, it has strong similarities to um, early D&D is the most obvious comparison as opposed to Traveller or something. And by that I mean is you go to a dungeon, you go through the dungeon, you clear the dungeon, you get XP by picking up gold functionally, uh, you get treasure, you clear rooms, you eventually clear the dungeon in whatever way you want to, uh, you don't have to actually finish it, you leave. Um, escaping is very dangerous and hard uh, and uh, <laughs> not to be recommended unless things are very desperate. It's, it's a funny table, but it's again a brutal one. You then go back to a settlement, but you have to travel in the wilderness. Wilderness hazards are dangerous. You go to a settlement and you can go to shops. Now, the settlement is also dangerous in this, more dangerous than, yeah, than the average D&D &D settlement is. Uh, but the play loop is very similar. It's just at a very cartoonish level, very high level. Okay, well, um, draw a card here's just the same thing again there is a at the events are there's basically a running joke in the role play book about the dwarf who gives you a key for the portcullis event this is obviously such a joke in the office at the time the portcullis keeps annoying people that there is it comes up twice as gags later in the book once is in the giant's uh, stat block we'll talk about i'll talk about the best here in a second but one is in the giant stat block one of the attacks on the nested tables through the giant special attacks you, in his stomach, you meet a dwarf who offers you a key for the portcullis. Um, you know, it's it's funny, it's dumb. Um, but uh, yeah, it is a comical version of D&D rather than of Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, I suspect. Uh, it's fair to say. Other things, uh, the wizard can learn more spells, which is pretty relevant uh, as well. Um, you get more detailed dungeon objective room treasure tables and dungeon events tables. So rather than using, this is in section two, which is to do with leveling up your characters, but then it also does stuff to do with leveling up the dungeon, basically, which makes sense. Rather than using the cards, use the tables um, and use uh, bestiary tables as well, uh, rather than for, uh, for monsters. So essentially the idea is you don't use the events on the cards, use the cards to determine whether it's an E for event or M for monster type event and then you refer to the tables so you get a much wider array of things that can happen uh, albeit you know I, I including much more power flex effects but yes still dumb uh, and the same for treasure you know you generate random treasure which means there's a lot more options far more options the most interesting thing about that and the treasure is for what it's worth uh, you know good good fun and all that we'll just these are the actual treasure cards. Um, there's treasure cards. Uh, the Chalice of Fate allows you to re-roll once per adventure, so once per game, uh, re-roll the wizard's power. You can sell it for 200 gold. Incidence of healing is use once then discard, but once you use it, every warrior gets 2d6 wounds restored. At first level, and in the generic game, remember that's all you'll ever be um, before adding the roleplay book. You, the, the Barbarian maxes out at 15 wounds. So you're, often, you're going to have heroes with kind of 10, 12, 14 wounds. Ring of Invisibility, you can just be invisible for one turn. Uh, a, that's just gold, uh, which, uh, yeah, you record and discard, albeit it's only three gold. A spear can be thrown um, against an enemy. So it's, it's a ranged attack option for someone who doesn't have a bow, because uh, only the elf has a bow uh, in, on their sheets. Everyone starts with bits of equipment, uh, special equipment and stuff. Again, differentiating the classes in the base game. So yeah, the the events and the monster, the events and the treasures are much more varied once you add in that section. Uh, there's also a, an extensive bestiary, which is one of the longest sections in this book. Um, it is, 
it is what's it's going to be at 68 pages of 192 or something so it's it's about a third of the book as the bestiary and the bestiary is based on the idea well it's based on two things one is based on the idea that the dungeon needs more variety and it's going to level up you know it's going to level up with the characters there are 10 um, tables for the characters as they go up in level they go up to 10th level the dungeon goes up to 10th level and once the when the average level of the party goes up uh, so does the the dungeon uh, there is actually advice on that to do with uh, mixed battle levels and think pa mixed parties um, and it's plain this is another interesting reference as you add in that stuff um, and as you're replacing heroes that have died or as new players join your campaign uh, you will start to see uh, it's another kind of thing pointing towards the role-playing heritage of, the, of this board game uh, which is that Dave Jones says look you know it's awkward to do this set of things but it is possibly worse or at least lamer to just have someone come in at the same level as the rest of the party you're a level three party so you have a, a, a third level new character join um what instead he says is and this should sound familiar is one you could have a stable of characters and you're leveling up characters on the lower parties and then they can level up and join the higher part the, the higher level party if needs be and two a mixed level party where you've got a low level barbarian with high level guy you know other guys uh, will let he'll level up quickly if he survives because of the amount of treasure you'll be getting and he'll be getting um that's something where because of uh, the exact way the gold works that might be more mechanically dubious if you read just the the rule book version of gold uh, there's an interesting thing where it's obvious that a couple of references suggest uh, for instance treasure in this room should be shared out as is appropriate for the cat for the characters involved you know treasure going to the right character um it's obvious that once you're into a more persistent campaign the idea that you might measure who won a dungeon by who got the most gold becomes less attractive um, and very quickly even in the scope of normal gameplay the fact that there are no rules covering either way covering swapping treasure other than fair treasure apportionment to do with victory points i in that kind of base semi-competitive game you realise, ah, actually, probably this game is meant to be one where treasure and gold and so on is semi-fungible. Um, and as I say, particularly because of references to the idea of sharing out treasure as is appropriate for the uh, characters to use, even though that would technically be unfair for the gold. Um, at that point, the campaign becomes more important than the board game in the strict sense of trying to win a board game. But yeah, the bestiary is obviously m making things harder for you uh, as you go up and making challenges more appropriate. So you're not seventh level fighting uh, goblins. So you get you get a lot of you basically get every model available at the time. Literally, pretty much every model available in ninety five in the fantasy range. Um, you get chaos, chaos dwarves, dark elves, giants, monsters, orcs, and goblins, skaven and undead. Crazy thing, by the way, realizing just while looking at some old books recently the sixth edition warhammer fantasy raveling hordes that came with white wolf uh, white wolf white dwarf had chaos dwarfs in, a, in as a list there was a semi-official list i a proxy list for sixth edition to play uh, chaos dwarves uh, which is crazy when you think about the you know how late that is in the game's life cycle and then of course there is that semi-official list later from the forge world list so you have lots of monsters uh you've got and, and this is as i say covering in the terms of the day uh, virtually everything that's uh, going on in there you know you've got giant scorpions and rat ogres and wivens under the monsters for instance and many others squig hunters with uh, their squigs you can have wild squigs or tame squigs you've got goblin shamans goblins goblin fanatics hobgoblins orcs black orcs savage orcs orc shamans and snotlings that's everything under orcs and goblins um, many many more and they have different abilities there is a detailed list of special rules for people uh, it's interesting you see they're added and this is the assumption that once you're in the campaign game things are getting more complicated uh, you get um, at least one functional rule change minotaurs gain fear uh, which can create a malice if you fail a um, a uh, check um, there's a, a new stat introduced in the section two uh, or in the next section two but um yeah basically you can see more stuff is getting added and there is an attempt to cover more situations and to give a lot more life uh, to this and of course the expansions which both both the big official expansions have 
uh, six new adventures, is it, based on their new objective room? So you can you could go up to 42 official adventures from the expansions and then at least another six. I'm not sure. I don't remember if there's any other for White Dwarf, but off the Skaven special uh, objective room that came in a White Dwarf issue. Uh, yes, yeah, so you've got very different thing feels to each of these as well. You know, obviously undead feel very different to orcs and goblins. And you can see, and, and even in the adventure book, there's things like the Skaven one, replace goblins with Skavens in this. The sense that a game might be more fun the more thematic it is. Um, but that's something which the high randomization of all that, all the tables and stuff can't provide. And it's still, it's one of the things that if, you, if your DM only ever used the 1E DMG, and this is an AD and D monster um, level tables to populate things, and that wasn't just one dungeon, but that was every dungeon, and you played for many years, and you, you got up to 10th level or 20th level, you'd probably feel like, oh wow, that was a weird experience. You know, nothing ever really glued together is essentially so highly procedural. You know, so highly procedural um, that um, there are many points where it felt incoherent and you know the G and this is assuming the GM doesn't makes no effort to glue it together. That is more or less what GMless campaign players here I think is very likely to be fun. Like um, as in I think I was, uh, having not run a long campaign of it, I couldn't say what it's like up when you get to the battle level ten. Um, but having just started, I'm like, yeah, this is fun. You know, having played plenty of Necromunda, uh, including a campaign play, yeah, yeah, that's fun. I, I'm I'm in favour um, of this. Uh, but it definitely feels there's something where it. It is a role-playing game now, I think. Um, it's a weak role-playing game as to the persistence in the campaign. There's no sense of a world. There's no sense of players setting objectives, potentially. Uh, there's no sense... Uh, and the dungeon is, is not super interactive. So, as I say, it's one, a mechanically very simple one. It is slightly more complex than your rules lights out there nowadays. Uh, it's a better game than those rules lights as a game. Um, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's a simple role-playing game very much focused on one area the one place you make serious decisions is in the dungeon um, and those are limited by the nature of the maps and the way the maps are generated and outside the dungeon a lot of it is kind of coin tossy stuff or kind of marginal odds you know just head edging hedging odds and stuff on the events uh, and sometimes stupid stuff happening and you die that changes, and I should say, just to give an example, this is just the new level one monster table. I did actually say there was a second reason why uh, you get all these monster tables with all these other models, which is that GW wants to sell you miniatures. Hey, look, here's some miniatures you can buy that aren't in the box. Uh, these are the minis, the monsters in the box. Uh, but they are, of course, saying, look, there's all these other ones. And there's some cool dioramas of them fighting. And there's a classic Chaos Dwarf. Uh, so they're very much saying, look, this is stuff you can buy. And there is, I forget which book it's in. Um, I think it must be in this one. But there is this absolutely infuriating uh, bit, uh, paragraph, which says, you know, if you want to use these, obviously they make sure you have the right miniatures. And if you don't, when you generate something, if you agree with the other players, then you can change it to a different result. And you think, so it's essentially attempting to enforce WYSIWYG at a private table not in a non-competitive game or not really competitive game and you just want to kind of go you realize they're trying to sell stuff and make money but it's just this so obvious mask off moment of we have to make money out of this somehow quest only ran two years the specialist games in general didn't run two you know their main runs might be that long or a bit longer i think necro ran slightly longer in its first run but not much longer uh it had more expansion products uh, in terms of larger ones at least uh, and a bigger range because it had gangs yeah, and it had blisters and it had um, one box expansion or one book expansion at least I think Outlanders was a standalone wasn't it but yeah so it didn't run that long I don't think it's that successful comparatively uh, they only returned to the idea uh, you know over 20 years later so it was not a, a roaring success uh, but um, yeah that, they're trying to sell you stuff now anyway Back to the, the discussion of the system and the rules. You have the basic game. You know, you've got your these guys, they're walking around, they're picking up, picking up a treasure, they're getting hit by traps, they're surviving to the end, perhaps there's you know, there's some role-playing game like mechanics. But it's a dungeon crawler. Then you have uh, the first two sections, or whatever you want to call them, I guess are they chapters perhaps, or whatever, of the role play book. And the role that, that adds in this um this second level 
of oh, persistence and levelling up. And it is, at this point, I think undeniably mechanically a limited role-playing game. It is limited, but it is a role-playing game, uh, whether you like it or not, because um, it... And in the set, or at least, it is as much of one, if not slightly more of one, in some limited respects, than Gloomhaven. It has much less of a campaign than Gloomhaven, uh, but the actual persistence and uh, and so on is much more similar at this point to traditional RPGs. Uh, so in one respect, it is even more so than Gloomhaven. But yeah, let's say it's at the level of being one of those very high level legacy dungeon crawlers or boxed RPGs. Um, the final section of the roleplay book is where things change to it not just being indisputably like a role-playing game, but indisputably a role-playing game and this is the games master and the sections here are the games master traps and secret doors character encounters what is role-playing creating adventures new warhammer quest character the troll slayer complete adventure death blow karakazgal and uh, here basically you have this idea that the uh, games master is a fifth player and he's the he's in charge of the game and this is made clear several times um, there are a couple of interesting moments where you can kind of see conflicting attitudes towards role-playing games, which exist within every DM, and certainly I, I suspect existed within Andy Jones. Um, these things kind of clashing a little bit, uh, but um, basically this idea is that the DM or the GM is running the game and uh, is running the adventures and controls the monsters, basically, particularly. The most relevant thing is that they are controlling the monsters and they are rolling on tables um, and they are drawing event cards and so on. They are running that side of it. But very quickly, the point is this is not really what the D GM is there to do. That is fun and just say, oh yeah, feel free to do a randomly generated adventure to start with it, get the rules down as a GM. But really, the GM is there um, to create content and to create much more interesting interacting adventures uh, that this system here we've just been looking at is too simple uh, basically one or in the set by that what i mean is once you have a gm the gm can make things much more fun this is fun this is a nice board game with role-playing elements that verges on being an rpg but the games master makes it a true role-playing game and um, some differences there it, just to quickly sum up things that are suggested uh, one, there is a declaration phase. This is an AD&D thing, isn't it? Uh, at the start of each turn, the characters announce what they're going to do, and it, um, barring specific circumstances, they don't change those those uh, actions. They cannot change them. Uh, there are circumstances they can change them in, but generally speaking, they can't. Uh, this, this and many other actions um, that the players can do, which we'll talk about when we talk about design adventures, relate to an, um, a new use of the initiative stat and the initiative stat is now specific, is now something you can test either mentally or physically um, and basically it, you may need an initiative test to change your action and you may have penalties and the GM is meant to assign those penalties but the real exciting thing is that the GM um, doesn't just uh, have, you know take the declarations and run the dungeon but they're adding content like I said so that means they may add their own random encounter tables. Uh, they may create special hazards for the players to overcome, their own dungeon events. Um, uh, they may create their own, uh, there's a suggestion, well, look, rather than just doing the generation to get to the settlement, have a map with options for where to travel and where you, the GM, know what's in those cities or those towns or those villages. And of course, there could be hooks, like I think the suggestion is if they go via one village on the way to the city. So rather than going the quickest way to the city, they go via a village because it's closer so they can stop there and get some stuff. Oh, there's a rumour of a new dungeon. So do, do they then go back to that dungeon? Well, that's that's a decision they can make. And you see here the GM opening up the world to the players. Um, but most importantly, of course, it's that the GM uh, can create new adventures. And those adventures, and Karakazgar, which I'll flick to straight away, in fact, from here, is uh, the example of this, Death Below Karaka Asgar. This is, um, uses a system called Deeps, which I don't think you necessarily need to use for an adventure, uh, but is th the idea of like linked dungeon levels. You know, it is in that sense like a D&D dungeon. And here you have a map. The map is preset and the map is keyed. So it is like, again, like a D&D or Rune Quest or, or even Traveler Adventure or whatever. And 
it has new features. So for instance, you can have pit traps uh, in uh, preset. You can have alarms preset. Uh, you can have uh, special rules for particular features on the map uh, that are already there. So the well in the well of doom or the dragon statue in the fire chasm, for instance. So you have all these options. Uh, that you can put in because the DM is running it. You can have secret doors that's and locked doors, uh, and the locked doors might be able to be broken down by being smashed potentially with strength checks or perhaps not. Uh, the secret doors can be found via, new, uh, via uh, you tr choosing to search. So you suddenly have in these advanced dungeons all kinds of dungeon actions being added back in, which bring us again perhaps probably not to, I from my. my reading of uh, WFRP, less to WFRP and more to D&D. I think there's a useful way of thinking of the advanced Warhammer quest as getting very close to, it, it's Warhammer D&D as opposed to Warhammer, Warhammer ro fancy role playing. In this adventure, uh, the sample one, I'll talk about this quickly and then we'll, we'll return. Um, in this adventure, the first deep is um, but one thing is that these uh, these this adventure does require uh, some potential new. I mean, you need an orc shaman who you won't actually fight for much in the first level. The second level is undead and chaos warriors, and the third level is alternative green skins who you won't get in the core box. So immediately, if you're following their advice, you're buying new stuff, and that's to be fair. Setting aside the annoying WYSIWYG rule attempt in a co-op game. Obviously, it's fun to get miniatures and paint them. The idea, or to use, it does say get your friend's miniature. You know, your friend can bring over his army. He's got some, some of these guys. Obviously, that's fun, and I'm all for that. Um, the first level is quite a good level uh, where you um, you basically can't... Uh, the, there is only one way because uh, here, this is magically locked door. Um, and it's visibly magically locked, which means... You don't have to set off the alarm by turning that way. If you think we're not gonna be able to open that, you don't open that way, you just go straight the other way to the guard room and get surprise. If you don't get surprise and you set off the alarm, the orcs and goblins there will come and get you. The orcs technically can be wanderers, uh, which it's, the, it does, it's not completely clear about the way it sets that up, but they can be wandering elsewhere in the dungeon and be in a different room. Um, so there's a living dungeon element here. Again, determine some of that to be fair. So the order of battle stuff on are orcs in this room or not um, could just about be done by players but it would still be giving away information orcs are not here they are somewhere else obviously you could pre-program that in the book that's that's probably not so complex um, and you see this in terms of those co-op crawlers with game books where you get information in gobbits and you're told to turn to this or this uh, to get the right information um, and you see you see it's also why you have automated Cult crawlers like Mansions of, the Mansions of Madness Second or whatever it is, and Journeys in Middle Earth, co-op crawl, you know, automated co-op crawlers using an app, so they can do these things for you. Anyway, uh, yeah, and then um, you may the basically you may be able to uh, discover using searching for secret doors the secret rooms, and uh, you can there you can technically go down. You, I don't think there's any reason you can't go down to the second level straight as soon as you get into this middle room. That would mean not killing off the Minotaurs um, and not even finding the stuff you've been sent to find up here. Uh, you're less likely to go down that way though because you're going to know, you're going to suspect there's things you need. Um, the second level, Undead themed, there's a whole thing where you start with a character encounter, though it's it ends up really being a villain encounter, but character encounters are things you're told you can build. You know, this guy might come um, and... Uh, join you on a quest or he might ask you to do something or they might be civilians you have to escort out character encounters are things again the dm is running as as npcs but yeah, the second deep is uh, a similarly theoretically slightly looped map uh, but in um in both in this case it's a more legitimate looped map i guess and it's relevant but because one of part of the loop is a trap room that's obviously slightly different vibe and in the first case, the uh, the loop was via a, was one way. You couldn't actually go via it. You could do the secret rooms created variation in terms of you could solve problems by finding secret rooms. Now, of course, one reason why wouldn't you always search for a secret room? The same reason as in old school D and D, because you're rolling every turn to see if there's a random encounter. Uh, so there are costs. There there's not a, a light cost. 
Um, there is a rule about light to do with everyone needing to be near a lantern, um, but there is not. Uh, you, you don't run out of torches, basically. But what you you know what you can do is uh, uh, you can waste time exploring and get killed because of it. Um, yes, the traps can be more inter interactive because there's a GM. Uh, but in this one, yes, uh, if you rescue the, the necromancer from the first room and you think he's just a normal guy, he will then end up later fighting you. There's various monsters in there. And then uh, then there's a really interesting thing. If you find, um, if you rescue, is it this guy? You rescue, rescue, is it? No, here's an interesting one. At the end of Deep One, if you rescue one of the dwarves who's gone missing um, at Karakar's Gaal, he will say, oh, I'm going to go home now. Do you want to come with me or not? And you can either go home with him and that's good because, you know, you can go and train up or whatever or buy stuff if you've got enough XP. You're not likely to have enough uh, gold to, to train after one adventure usually, but you, you might do. And more to the point, uh, you, um, you may want to heal up. Uh, it does suggest if you immediately continue, you'll heal straight up. I'm not sure that's a that's probably bad practice. And it does say, oh, just give them, if you need justification, give them some healing potions they find. I don't love that as a as an adventure principle, but you know, just explaining how they how Andy Jones does it. Um, but if you leave with him, you can go and heal, and you can go and train, you can go and buy resources, refresh your treasure. If you keep going and he goes off on his own, then uh, the enemy isn't warned. If they are warned by you going away, the Chaos Warriors have set traps, and you have to deal with traps. There is a cost to your decisions to travel or not. It, that that's really good. That's that's. This adventure is better designed than most adventures for D&D &D in 1995. It may be better, I don't think, I think Cordell publishes maybe just at the very end of 95. Um, but yeah, uh, or he at least is on staff then. The Pit of Darkness is, there are two ways. Technically you can you can break through either way, uh, but Grimcrag's resting place, the door into it from the other way is one way only. So. There is again a, uh, the idea that you're meant to loop, be forced to loop round. Even if you break your way that way, you can't loop. So again, there are, though there's no loop here, it's also a limited choice because again, this um, is is locked. Um, I need to get a key and stuff. These are, you know, limitations uh, to this that, uh, and it's partly based on the tiles that exist. I think if you had twice the tiles, you'd see much more complex dungeon plans. And it's a, that's a limitation of tiles versus, and it's the same with if you're using dungeon tiles for D and D, but tiles compared to just drawing it on a map on a piece of paper, grid paper. But yeah, you go through. Uh, a relevant thing is you get trapped here, so you couldn't even go back. There's a cave in, and there is a really fun trap, which a uh, uh, co ma magic magical loop corridor where if you take this door here, you end up here. And it does give detailed instructions how players might work this out, you know, based on them waiting in ambush or based on them seeing a light ahead or based on one of them staying behind and everyone else going around and then them turning up behind them. That's clever. Of course, as soon as you realise there's a trap, it's a loop, it's an illusion, uh, you search for the secret door. Uh, but that's a really clever... Again, you should just use that in a D&D dungeon if you play D&D. You find your way around. There's a bunch of encounters. The well chamber in this one... Um, will fill up. There is an annoying, there are a couple of bits like this which is again I think partly based on the limitations of the um, the physical design even with all the new actions you can take with a GM which is that the GM advice is to discourage the players from accessing the world first because then it floods up in two rounds and everyone dies unless they escape uh, or whatever it is rather than uh, just letting the players pick. Generally speaking um, this is still a game. It's still first and foremost a game. That is one of a couple of examples like this. The vast majority of the time, the emphasis is on being fair, on providing a challenge, on the players shouldn't have a walkover, but they also shouldn't be just overwhelmed. Um, you could say it's it's balance focused in a way that, you know, fourth edition might be of D&D, &D, but first edition isn't. But of course there is that in dungeon tables and in general adventure design principles, you see that Gary designs for the level he's expecting the party to be at, not much higher or much lower. There might be outliers, and there can be outliers here based on particular kinds of tables and stuff. So, uh, and three minotaurs is worse than one if you're randomly generating them. You can also have, by, by the book, multiple random encounters happening at once. The wandering monster check keeps going. You eventually can find uh, the... Um, 
uh, yeah, it, you, you can, um, uh, yeah, you can uh, then get out and finish the dungeon. You might be able to then go down into another deep. Very suggestions about where to next if you finish that deep. You, it could end up that the portal at the end gets you to Middenheim. Why is Middenheim, this holy city of Auric, connected to uh, this dwarven ruin in the world's edge mountains? Um, it could be that there's a further deep, which is where the Chaos Warriors came up from, who are on level two. Uh, there is uh, the Orc Shaman from level one, flees to level three. The guy in level two does have necromantic magic, but it's crap, so it's not very powerful. That's a way of nerfing him down to the level you're at. You're... So you eventually hit a real magic user with quite dangerous abilities, including one potential auto kill. Uh, it's a off a 2d6 table, one of the sub results there nested. So it's going to be a more or less a 1 in 36 or a, t a 1 in 18, I think, chance of that happening uh, when he casts a spell. That's pretty high. Uh, but yeah, the maps, though they're simple, are fun. The traps are fun. The actions players can take are fun. He adds in other kinds of treasure and stuff here that you find. You, though you will be drawing um, treasure cards still, you're also finding dungeon room treasure, you know, just other stuff you can find. There's uh, treasure in locked, bo locked boxes. Um, and one thing is because you can end up, uh, because of how intellectual initiative works in initiative checks, um, some people might be better at mechanical stuff and you might give them bonuses to that, whereas other people might be worse. You can also then specialise potentially into that. There's a specialisation system. The dwarf basically, for instance, will be better at locks. And especially if you get him lock picks, you might get plus two to his roll, whereas the wood elf might be a bit less interested in mechanical stuff, as might the barbarian. So yeah, the, the, this adventure format, at this point, you're just doing a DD and d dungeon with a GM using a different rule system and a dungeon tile system. Uh, there are, uh, and, uh, and there's a new action sheet, and, and he does suggest, you know, again, the players might improvise actions. Not everything is covered by the rules. You have to make it fit within what the rules can do, but there's a basic characteristic test. You need seven plus on a modified die roll. So you roll that D6, add your stat, modify it, uh, it needs to end up at, at net 7 plus. So you might need 9 plus, whatever it is, if you're at minus 2. Um, but there's a modified characteristic test, which is the basic test. You can adapt that to all kinds of stuff. You're encouraged not to let players mess around with that too much. Um, you, you know, there's the declaration phase. There's lots of stuff which is should be reminiscent of early D&D um, and where the GM is meant to make it challenging but fair. There's a couple of moments of, of things which feel more, you know, more story gamey or something. So, or just a lazy design. No, you don't let them pull up the chain because that will ruin the room. You know, make sure they check the treasure first so they have the right treasure items. Or again, um, the particular example is a character encounter where you have a stat line for the characters, the, the NPC, but you should not let the players see it. And the example given is in case the NPC is on 34 wounds but needs to be insta-killed in an assassination. And though, of course, there may just about be a place for that in, in an old school game, and um, that's something that most of us who are into older school style D&D play wouldn't do. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's a one-off. And the basic thing here for those of us, again, those of us interested in old school gaming, the very early days of RPGs and how this actually is, in 1990s terms, one of the few things on the block doing it, is that because this starts... As a board game this is the criticism oh it's it's not a role play not criticism the, you know the comment this isn't a role-playing game it's a board game with very light rpg elements that's it once you add in the gm the fact that gm is basically being told no this is a game and you have to play fair and it has to be a serious game is ultimately because this starts as a game ultimately this is a simpleish dungeon crawler um it is an advance on hero quest it's it's uh you know it's it's in that same genre um it's literally an advance on hero quest uh, but the idea is that this is just you um, you playing a game and then you add persistence and that game slightly changes and then you add a GM and that game slightly changes, but it is ultimately a game. And this means that playing fair and having a real challenge and the possibility of winning or losing um, and win, the win condition being survival and advancement rather than, uh, it's, there'll be story concerns, but rather than um, it being all about a big meta plot, um, is because of the nature of this as a game. There are limitations to that too, absolutely, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but I think you're talking about a, a, because of that, you're talking about something that ends up being really quite old school. Um, 
I think I would say I think it's it's basically quite successful. Um, I, uh, as well as the game we're playing, which is co- well, what I'm thinking I'll do is that co-op game uh, will morph into me GMing for you know my my kids, my wife, friends, whoever uh, their characters. Um, now at that point, it's interesting because Jones has said write your own settlements, have a map with locations on it that have different um, distances. And that might have rumours attached depending on the route they take. Why not make your own dungeon tables? And this is the thing that uh, I should say, the dungeon tables for Karakazgal, there are no dungeon tables, or rather they're, they're new or, or one-off. Um, the deep deep one has a D6 check if there's a random encounter, and it's either a Minotaur, Snotlings, Goblins, or Orcs. Uh, number two, deep two, is Mummy, Ghouls, Skeletons, Zombies, Giant Rats and Giant Bats, or some gold. And three is you roll on the dungeon events table in here, not from there. There's no monsters wandering on on number three. So you're encouraged to do that. You're encouraged to add special wilderness hazards, which the players have to deal with. And the uh, example given is uh, it's still very much a table version of it, you know, from the from the events table. But a character is kidnapped in an overnight ambush and you follow him to a dungeon. Um, now, that is obviously a, a uh, arm twisty way of getting players to adventure. But the principle of you could just you should add stuff and do stuff is there. This is your game. This is not something where you're relying on these tables. You might use them, but they are not the rules anymore. They are a tool, um, which is, of course, very much like uh, the DMG. Um, I think that's uh, yeah, that's um, a sign that really we should be moving beyond the limitations of the base game using the basically the stuff that in the base game is is very strong and enjoyable is the basic dynamic of moving and fighting. The role-playing game master section adds all the new abilities, which make it much more interactive, much more like a full role-playing game. Um, And then the other thing that you're definitely going to keep, in the sense I think it works and it's good, is the advancement system. You know, it's... it's, uh, And the classes are very interesting. I'll talk about classes in a moment to finish as well, actually. But what you're then going to add is your own hazards, your own wilderness and so on. And you realise that Actually, in terms of the modding community or whatever, this is a significant amount of what goes on. Is even White Dwarf, there was a very short and adequate article on how you might do adventures outside. Uh, the idea being this is a much more continuous space. It suggests a A1, one inch gridded um, piece of paper laminated. Uh, that would make sense. That's a good idea. Um, so you can draw on it. Another suggestion, which is very good, which I'll certainly, I certainly, I think is what I will use. Um, is using D&D dungeon tiles. I say this because I have two sets of wilderness tiles, so might as well. Um, you and and there's you know other suggestions like that. There's the Beyond the Grey Mountains fan hack, which is uh, available on where well, it's on uh, dry Google Drive. Search for it and find the guy about talking about it on Twitter because his the website he let lapse, but he has put it up on Google Drive still. And uh, you could use that, and that has procedures for travelling around and what happens and what could be available in different cities. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, and the remaining thing to think about, so that's already encouraged and built in and was very quick expanded by fans. E- even it was in White Dwarf, you know, with the go outside. There's also some, um, the White Dwarf articles, though they are as very high on variance and and randomised as the core book, if you're into that, you can still use that. Like there's um, the Sea Harbour and then Sea Travel Hazards, and then some thematic stuff about how you can have adventures in Lustria, which was obviously coming out, um, you know, a year after or whatever it was, or nine months after Quest, you have fifth edition uh, Warhammer come out with, or maybe it's slightly less than that, uh, it comes out. But yeah, with with uh, with Lizardmen from Lustria. Uh, so yeah, you have um, uh, like a lot of options for adventures. Uh, the one thing you might still consider altering slightly, um, apart from you know and the biggest thing would probably be scrapping the hazards and the wilderness hazards and uh, city stuff and writing your own but the thing that he doesn't say oh change it massively is that you might push a bit more on dungeon design and that would require having a wider set of tiles there are fan tiles there were two expansions as well with more tiles and corridors tons of fan fan expansions particularly by little monk um and if you add all that together you can make very big maps and so i think that's that's the one thing is you might want just some more resources for that um, I don't think you must need to press on the bestiary. Uh, I say that without the expertise of playing to high levels, other than knowing roughly both the mass of this and how the stats in Warhammer tend to scale. 
Um, you know, but I, I think there looks like there's a, such a strong core engine here that in terms of the basic cycle of being in the dungeon and fighting and doing stuff, that's going to be fine. Um, and there's no reason it has to be as combat heavy, particularly because gold is the currency, not combat XP. And character encounters are often meant to be positive. Why not? Ha and, and even negotiation, you can bluff and, um, and negotiate and stuff as an action. Why not have more of that? Why not role play that? Um, and plan that into the dungeons. But you might need more dungeon tiles. Uh, the two expansions, one is orc themed, one is undead themed, and they both come with figures, rules. I mean, you know, these are gonna be virtually impossible to find raw, um, you know, hundreds of pounds on eBay. Uh, but you can get all of the stuff off various fan websites, uh, print and play websites, which you can Google, and uh, you might be able to find the figures or and certainly you can proxy them. So that's probably less relevant. You can replace the stuff. Uh, but the Lair of the Orc Lord has uh, orcs and it has three three deeps in that one, three levels to the dungeon. And um, Catacombs of Terror is Tomb Kings, we'd call it Tomb Kings themed, it's undead themed. And uh, it has five deeps, but it has three of them are small to a bigger. And so it has a different dynamic and feel to how you adventure through it. Um, and yeah, these are the, 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 the there's also six as i say six adventures for the objective room an objective room is bigger than than the ones i showed you um and uh there is one big little monk has one full expansion uh something of the witch queen whatever it's called it's a dark elf themed one uh, he also has several mini expansions which just have the semi -ra the randomized adventures based on the objective room plus rules for monsters without a gm-led campaign the final thing to say, and there are many, also many fan versions of this, but is to talk about the uh, expansion, the main expansion packs that really came out, the character packs. And this is relevant to this because this has an entire free character with it who is not in the box, the, the Dwarf Troll Slayer. There's no figure. You're meant to go and buy an official figure. Um, I have many Troll Slayers, which helps me. There is actually, I think, there's a, the, there's the Troll Slayer figure. I think they eventually used for it. I think it's a Dragon Slayer, isn't it, the figure? possibly uh, but yes uh, you uh, can be a troll slayer who is a dwarf so can maybe able to go to the dwarf guild master uh, but has limitations on that and has his own location and has his own rules like he can't retreat from combat things like that but he's also very good at lots of stuff he can't wear armor but he has a thing where if he's reduced to zero wounds he has essentially an invuln save at at zero wounds eye he's on one wound at five plus while he sings his death song and every time he's wounded and we go down to zero he can attempt to stay singing his death song um, and there's lots of characters official ones plus the unofficial ones i have the i can definitely have the troll slayer because i have many troll slayer figures i've got the war dancer uh, who is another wood elf so use the wood elf rules i have the witch hunter who is an empire character um, and i have the imperial noble who's an empire character um, there's also a a uh, high elf um one high elf character there was um a uh, i'm trying to think who else there's a warrior pre imperial warrior priest there was a bretonian knight um there's a pit fighter a chaos warrior eventually as well i don't actually remember the gimmick there like why he's allowed to travel with them uh, but you get the idea there's all these different things uh, again you can get all the, the stuff online but that is thing you get in the box and if you uh, most people i'm sure would have been quite happy to have a troll slayer and just proxy in either any dwarf they had or anything else they had a chess man indeed uh, so in terms of it's not there's not much to say about a, a 20 year old game or an 18 year old game in terms of value but at the time it would have been 40 pounds um you're presenting a really big value proposition there uh, whatever the WYSIWYG stuff I thoroughly recommend this um, you know it's hot you know it's gonna be hard to get but you can just print and play it I think is the thing you can print and play it for a a basically a fraction of the original cost uh, and minis you can source yourself out of your collection uh, the minis are quite nice by the way they're on it they're they are monopose plastic um, especially designed for this but uh, they're, they're, they're more heroic and more designed than some of the monopose plastic that came in the five pound boxes if you remember those like the goblins the dwarf warriors the um chaos dwarfs uh they're more heroic and more specific but they're of a similar sort of chunkiness um because plastic that's how plastic cast uh, and in the mid 90s even the metals were only a bit finer though they were more detailed generally uh, but yeah i i thoroughly enjoyed it i'm planning as i say to transition 
the co-op games I'm playing with with the kids to a proper campaign of this. This is something which will fulfill. I want to play a uh, fancy role play as well. Um, but this thematically and rules level uh, is much more appropriate for, for my kids, basically. And I think um, it's lighter in that sense. And you can add in the, fu the fun stuff about role playing games. I, by that, I mean the kind of the, the in terms of the persistence without complicate, massively complicating the other rules. Um, whereas I think fancy role play both is thematically much darker and is um, fourth edition, which is the edition I have, is much heavier than this. Anyway, that is me on Warhammer Quest. If you have played this, uh, or if you have wanted to play it, I remember I did in the 90s, um, tell me what you think in the comments. Uh, and uh, I'll probably do a Let's Play on this. I think I've, I've considered for a while about different options, but I probably will do something here to go through it. Uh, but yeah, tell me um, what, what other kind of things you're interested in uh, seeing me talk about. And you'll see I've got a lot of D&D content on the channel. Um, so dip into that if you want. I will see you next time.